We have a lot to thank the Lord for, don't we? Do we not? I mean, think about it. Even if everything was taken away tomorrow, would you still be able to thank the Lord for all He's done for you? All the blessings that He's given to you? All the goodness that He showed to us? Um, I want to go to tonight to look at um, a passage of Scripture that speaks about Thanksgiving. And it really speaks about Thanksgiving all throughout the history of God's people. And, uh, you know, the Bible is a supernatural book, isn't it? It really is. You ever start to dig down into it, you'll see, you know, people talk about supernatural this, supernatural that. You get down in the Bible and you'll start seeing things. The Holy Spirit will start revealing things to you that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. And uh, it's amazing what he'll show you in, in just one of these old psalms. These psalms written between 1000 to 700 B.C. Uh, telling the story of redemptive history over the centuries. It's just pretty amazing. I want you to open up your Bibles, literally. Open them up. You know, I'm not going to go through the PowerPoint tonight. I want you to literally open that Bible up. And I want you to turn to Psalm 107. And look at it in your Bibles as we go through it here tonight. And we're going to go through this passage. And we're going to think about it. We're going to talk about it. We're going to take in uh, the great mercy of our Lord upon us. It says here, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. You know, in the current culture in which we're living in, people might ask, well, why? Why should I give thanks? And a lot of people do. Why should I give thanks to God? Maybe I was born with some kind of a disease or maybe all these bad things are happening to me. Maybe I have all these struggles that's going on. Why should I give thanks to God? Well, the psalmist, he didn't leave us with just the commandment to give thanks unto the Lord. He also tells us why we should give thanks unto the Lord. He looks here and he says, number one, for he is good. Anything that happens uh, from God is good. You say, well, why is there all these bad things? Why are there all these evil things that happen in the world? Why is there uh, children being raped and, and kids being killed and all these wicked things occurring? Well, God, in his love and his goodness, decided not to make a group of slaves, but a group of free individuals. And you know what the cost of that is, of you being a free individual? Sin. A horrible world. People doing horrible things. But in that, God is still good. He has still made a way to bring those away from that darkness, to bring them away from that evil by sending His Son to die for us, didn't He? So we can say God is good. We should give thanks, right? We should give thanks. And then he gives number two, for his mercy endureth forever. I think about how patient the Lord has been with me over my life, and sometimes I have to just sit back and say, thank you, Lord, right? He is awful patient with a lot of stubbornness, uh, stupidness, ignorant things that I personally have done, and I assume you have as well, right? Because we've all done things that, that was just uh, totally against what was good and what was right. But the Lord's mercy endured. It says forever, forever. Now we know there's a stopping point sometime when God's hand will be pulled back. But so who is this talking about? Who is this speaking to here in your Bibles? Now remember to look at your text. For his mercy endureth forever. And then he says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. So he's speaking his mercy endureth forever for those he hath redeemed, right? Those who have been saved by His grace, His mercy is there. Sometimes His mercy will literally take you out of this world. You know that? You know that? It will. He'll take you right out of the world, uh, out of a mercy to you of what you're going to do once you've received that sa saving grace that He has given to us. And then He tells us there about being from the, He's redeemed us from what? The hand of the enemy. I don't know if you know this or not. But there is a war out here. It's not a war with bombs and guns and tanks, but it is a spiritual war of the world, the flesh, and the devil. And they are fighting against God, 
And that's why we see a lot of the damage around us. That's why we see a lot of the, the people uh, not wanting to, to come and worship his holy name. That's why we see all of this because there's this war. There's this enemy that is keeping people from real life in Christ, aren't they? There is this enemy out here that is keeping them from that. And so we know that the Lord is good. We should give thanks for him because he's good. His mercy endures to us, the redeemed, in the midst of this war. And where is God gathering all of his people from across the world? Where is he gathering? He says he gathers them here in verse 3 out of the lands from the east and the west, from the north and from the south. Now he started that call all the way back in Genesis, didn't he? Who did he go to first? He went to Abraham. Well, he went to Adam. Adam kind of forsook him. There was a godly line of Seth. There's a few here and there. But it wasn't until Abraham come along and he called him out of Ur of the Chaldees. He said, I'm going to take you to a land, to a city where your home is, a great city. And so he called him out of that place. And, and his people eventually found their home there, didn't he? Abraham set up land. But then they all moved away. They all moved, uh, got moved down to Egypt during that famine. And after that, they found themselves to be enslaved in Egypt. You know, this is how we are. This is how we are. We come to a place where God gives us something good and we're thankful, right? But then we turn to this cycle where we get unthankful. And then where do we end up? We end up in Egypt and chains, don't we? We end up in Egypt. It says here, uh, when he pulled them out of Egypt, this is what happened. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way, and they found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted them. Forty years wandering around the wilderness. Then they cried in the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city of habitation. To that city. Now, speaking here of the land. They went back to their land right down there. They took their land back and they went in. They, they got rid of all the, the pagans and took their land back in Israel uh, after they come out of Egypt. But this is speaking more than just being about the land. There is a land we're searching for, isn't there? There is a land we're searching for that's beyond all of this, whose builder and maker is God, right? That's what he was, Abraham was looking for. He got a physical land. The physical land is promised to him. But all of us are promised that spiritual land, aren't we? That's coming ahead. And then we give thanks to God for what we've been given in that. It says here, we, we should, verse 8, Oh, that men, and that's women too, the idea is mankind, would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfied the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. I'm willing to bet us sitting here, every one of us have food tonight, don't we? Right? Every one of us have food at home. Matter of fact, you may have two or three turkeys at the house waiting for you on Thanksgiving, right? I mean, we're, we are blessed with food. And I would bet that everybody I'm speaking to here tonight, you have a warm bed to go to. You have a home. And everyone that is saved by God's grace, they have a home outside their body in heaven one day, don't they? A home set apart. Do we give thanks for it? Is that what we're here for to do tonight? Is to give thanks to God for a food and a home and a heavenly home? Well, the old Israelites, the old Israelites, here they were, they come out of Egypt, they come back, and here they found themselves, and for several hundred years they stayed in the land, and they become what? Unthankful again, didn't they? They began to forget about God, and what happened to them? They got brought down to Babylonian captivity. Not, not uh, uh, Bologna captivity, but Babylonian captivity, right? The man from uh, Babylon, he come in, Nebuchadnezzar, he draw those people out, didn't he? Out of the land. And this was God's judgment upon them. And it speaks about it here in verse 10. Such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction iron, because they rebelled against the words of God, and condemned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. Then they cried 
unto the Lord in their trouble. And he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and break their bands in sunder. <laughs> Are you thankful for the freedom, God? Have you ever had your freedom taken away? Not many of us have. Not many of us have been put in a jail cell and known what that's like, that you can't go here or there. Not many of us have had our, our hands clamped. And none of us have ever been drug off to a foreign land and uh, forced to be in slavery, have we? None of that has happened. But that happened here to those Israelites. And, and the, the psalmist here, he cries out once again. Because you know what's going to happen. God does that. He hears them in Babylonian captivity. He brings them back to the land into the second temple period here, right? He brings them back. But they forget to praise the Lord. And they end up going back the same way. Oh, that men, he says in verse 15, would praise the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he hath broken the gates of brass and cut the bars of iron in sunder. I'm thankful for my freedom here in America that I had the freedom of religion, right? But I'm also thankful for the freedom that God gives. The freedom from sin. There was a time in my life when I thought in my mind that being a Christian and doing what God wants you to do, that was putting your hands in chains. That was putting you in a jail cell and keeping you from having fun. And you know who told me that, don't you? The old devil himself told me that and my own wicked flesh. But I learned something. There's freedom in, in not having to be like the rest of the world. There's freedom uh, from that sin that so easily besets us when we know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, right? He makes us new and free. But, as we said, Israel falls again. And this time we switch we're not talking about things that have happened in the past here. We're talking about things that are going to happen in the future. Because remember, this was written in uh, 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 the, before Christ. You see, right here, we get a picture after 400 years of silence of, of, of them rejecting their God when he comes to earth. Fools, it says in verse 17, because of their transgression, that's sin, and because of their iniquities, are afflicted. Their soul abhorreth all manner of meat. They don't want nourishment. They don't want to be fed what God has given them. They don't want that. And they draw near to the gates of death. How many people have you seen like that over your life who would rather uh, have a meal in the midst of wickedness than they would to have a good meal in a nice warm place? They'd rather go dance around the pit of hell than they would enter into the glories of heaven. And they do that of their own mind. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, it says, and he saveth them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Now in Matthew's gospel, he reminds us that, uh, that Jesus come, he also healed the sick. Isaiah, in Matthew 8, 17, he speaks back to it by the prophet Isaiah. He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. He took that from us. You know, sin is a disease. Do you understand that? It really is. We've all got it. We've all got it in us. And we all dance around with it and have it around us. And it keeps us blinded to what a real life can truly, where real joy comes from, right? Real joy can only be seen in that. But when Christ came, they turned away not only his physical healing that they seen him going around healing all these people, they turned away the spiritual healing that they could have, right? You know, Sunday we talked about uh, that one. He looked at that leper and he said uh, to be made whole. Well, that was physical, but it also meant spiritual, right? A spiritual healing. And the psalmist cries out again, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. The old Jews, they kept on doing those sacrifices in that temple. And the greatest sacrifice at all had come in Jesus Christ our Lord, laying down his life for our sins, wasn't it? And now our life is, is to give thanks to him. That, that's what the true idea of the sanctification 
of your spirit is once you've been saved, once you've been justified, you are sanctified through that thanksgiving offering that you give within your heart each and every day of your life. It's a joy to follow him. Now this next part here, it reminds you here of the disciples on the water with Jesus. But I also think it could mean something else. You see, the ancient mind, when they looked out at the ocean and the sea, they thought in their minds that's the scariest place you could ever go. That is a place of chaos out there. Why do they think that? Because the waters would float up and down. And when you're on land, does it do that? No. You're on a firm foundation. But when they looked at the waters, it was a place of chaos. It was a place of, uh, of Gentile nations almost, uh, of, of, of chaotic nations all around. But listen to what it says here in verse 23. They that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to heaven. They go again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of what trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man or at their wits end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble. Listen to that. In their trouble. And he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm so that the waves are still. That's what Jesus did out there on the waters, didn't he? For those disciples. He spoke and the waves stood still. Then are they glad because they be quiet. So he bringeth unto them their desired haven and gets them to the location. Because it was a scary thing, my friend, to get on a ship in the first century, or, or any century up till now. I mean, you've kind of got a safe idea that you're going to get from here to there. But most of the time throughout the ages, people were scared to death to go out in the waters. They knew that there was trouble, that there was tribulation out there. Now, this, you may think this is a big stretch here, but could this depict Israel's final storm? There's coming a day when the rapture of the church is going to take place. Everybody's going to disappear that's a Christian off the face of the earth. And then we'll begin the time of Jacob's what? Trouble, right? A trouble some time for them. And in that storm, the idea is that great tribulation. And that sea typifies the restless Gentile nations. And the seamen that are on it is the nation of Israel. They're being tossed back and forth all during those seven years of trial and tribulation that's coming upon them. But at the end of that, what does it say? All Israel shall be saved. Why? Because they'll see their Lord and they'll cry out to him and they'll look upon him who, hath been, who is pierced, as it says in the book of Isaiah, and all Israel shall be saved, won't they? Amen. They're coming back. They're coming back. That remnant at the end will be saved who will receive him by grace through faith. What does the psalmist remind us once again? Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness. Think about a nation that is spit in their Savior's face for 2,000 years, and he goes through all of that to bring them back. To bring them back. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men, the children of men, the children of the Jewish people, the one who will be in that time of Jacob's trouble. Let them exalt him also in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. Are you thankful for the lack of trouble in your life? Do you ever realize how much trouble you could get into? Do you ever think about that? You know, I, I was driving down the road, and I, I take an hour-long drive to work each day. And I think in my mind sometimes, you know all the things that could happen to me that God is preventing as I'm taking this drive. I mean, I'm going at 70 miles per hour up the interstate. The other day, I was driving up through there, and there was this vehicle and this vehicle, and they all come over with those three lanes right in front of me, and they about hit one another, and one jerked off to the side this way. But if they had hit one another, I would have plowed straight into them. But right at the last minute, one of them pulled off and, and, and got out of the way. I, I, I saw that salvation that God took care of me. But how many times does God take care of us? How many times does God uh, tighten up the, the, our wheels on our vehicle like you did there, Brother Rick, remember? How, how many times does he take care of us in that? And we don't even realize what's going on, right? We don't even realize it and may never realize 
All the times that God's hand has been there in protection, keeping us on the track that we need to go. We got a lot to be thankful for, okay? We got a lot to be thankful for when we think about it. We got to be thankful for what's here at the end of this, this chapter as well. It says here, looking forward, I believe, to that millennial kingdom that will come after that great tribulation. He turneth the rivers into a wilderness and the water springs into dry ground, a fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of them that dwell therein. You know, in that millennial kingdom, there'll be those who are without, won't they? Those who will be outside of God's grace. And there he maketh the hungry to dwell that they may prepare a city for habitation. And sow the fields and plant vineyards which may yield fruits of increase. He blesseth them also that though they are multiplied greatly and suffereth not their cattle to decrease. Again, they are minished and brought low through oppression, affliction, and sorrow. He poureth contempt upon princes and causeth them to wander in the wilderness when there is no way. Yet setteth he the poor on high from affliction and maketh him families like a flock. The righteous shall see it and rejoice and all iniquity shall stop her mouth. That's what it says is coming in that millennial kingdom one day. It's all going to stop. All that sin, all those things, and God will rule the world for a thousand years. It speaks about two different sides here in Revelation 22, verse 12 through 16. It says, Jesus was speaking. He said, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. You want his reward? Well, it's kind of an easy reward to get in the beginning. You just receive it by grace through faith. But then through sanctification, we grow. There's different rewards for different people. You know, somebody once told me one, one time, God doesn't give out rewards. I said, have you ever read the Bible? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. There is a reward for those who, who deal with affliction. There's a special reward for the pastor, I've heard. A special crown that is given for that. There's all these special rewards, and God will give those to his people in that day. It's just a reward to be in heaven, my friend, okay? But he says here, Jesus said to give every man according as his work shall be. He says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. But what does it say without? Dogs. That's not talking about puppy dogs. That's talking about those who are into wickedness. And sorcerers, the idea is drug use and magic, and whoremongers, and murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, he says, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David, and the bright and morning star. Friends, I want to be on that other side. You know who's on that other side? Who enters into that gate? Those who are thankful. Those who give thanks for what God has done. And look and see things as they really are. This last verse. You ought to write this down. You ought to keep this to the side. It's a precious verse. Whoso is wise in verse 43. And will observe these things. Even they shall understand. The loving kindness of the Lord. Do you know. How much God loves you. Do you know. How much. His love is for you. You know, I'm just the messenger. All I am, I'm just the messenger of these things. But God has spent all of human history preparing a plan to redeem you and bring you from the four corners of the earth to Him because He loves you that much. We've got a lot to be thankful for, don't we, church? We've got a lot to be thankful. I hope you're enjoying the sermons here and have subscribed to my channel on YouTube, but I would love even more to meet with you in person at the church where I'm blessed to pastor at in White Pine, Tennessee, Omega Baptist Church.